Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm glad to say that Rusi has been in the forefront of the discussion about the selection of the new UN uh, Secretary General. We were fortunate to have quite a number of the candidates for that position uh, speaking at the Institute over the last um, a few months. And I suspect that we may have to keep a few slots open because it's in the nature of this particular race that new candidates appear. Uh, and I'm glad to say even some male candidates dared to make an appearance uh, in, the last, um, in the last few months. But I think we would all agree that this has been probably the most open and the most fiercely contested of the positions for a long time. And this is how it should be. Uh, this, the selection of what must be one of the most important civil, international civil servant positions should be much more open, should be much more inclusive, both in terms not only of gender, dare I say, but also of perspective, of continents, and of countries taking, taking part in it. Um, I would be extremely disappointed uh, if the ultimate result is the one that we always know, which is a last-minute deal between about five ambassadors in one back room in New York, but it probably will end up being something like that. Um, however, I, I think it's fair to say that nothing will be the same because there are certain uh, precedents that have been created which will be difficult for countries to roll back uh, uh, in, the, in the future. Anyway, it gives us a great pleasure to have uh, to welcome this afternoon uh, uh, Professor Pusic to the Institute. Um, she needs no introduction for me. She had a very distinguished record, both as an academic uh, and as a, a minister uh, in Croatia, she had all the right positions that would have exposed her to the uh, to the to the um, to the position that she's now competing for. Um, and as we've done with previous meetings, uh, we will first of all uh, hear the candidate and then uh, uh, have a good questions and answer session. So, uh, Professor Pusic, the floor is yours. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity and for inviting me here. Um, after the initial sort of stage fright uh, from you know, running for a position in an organization that in my country and in my part of the world certainly always had a very distinguished reputation. And in spite of having had first-hand experience with the UN and with the most sensitive aspect of UN, and this is peacekeeping, on our own territory, it maintained this authority of the sort of ultimate international organization and multinational uh, fora uh, with uh, issues that are in a way, have been with all of us all our lives, but at the UN, they get this special visibility. But after the initial stage fright, as I said, having to sort of put yourself up for scrutiny for a job that I always thought was probably the most distinguished uh, on earth, not because it's, it's defined that way, which I will return to a little later, but because it, over the years, through the people who occupied that position, earned itself that kind of authority. Because the post of Secretary General, as it is defined by the UN Charter, is not that distinguished. It's a high-level administrator, with not much influence outside of that, because all the real decisions are being made by the member states, and in particular by the Security Council, and more specifically by the five permanent members of the Security Council. 
And this is how the organization has functioned. But at the same time, over the years, um, the people who, who occupied the post of the Secretary General, especially some of them, through the authority of their own personality, through their courage, through their imaginativeness, through their creativity, have developed a certain authority for the position of the Secretary General. And I think whoever looks at that post has to be aware of the fact that if you're going to, first of all, if you're going to be able to do anything as a Secretary General, you have to have that type of authority. And the fact that you get elected Secretary General doesn't give you that authority. You will have, whoever gets elected will have to earn the uh, respect and build her or his authority. I really sincerely hope it's going to be her this time around because it would be a, a first. Um, and it does make sense, and I will maybe come to this also a, a little bit later. But um, it's not something that is a given. And whoever gets elected will have to, in order to be able to do something herself, but also in order to promote the vision, mission, and interest of the organization, will have to be able to build a sort of personal authority. Because if she or he doesn't do that, it damages the organization. And the best, uh, I would say, argument can be made by looking at what has happened this time around in the process of the selection of the Secretary General. Um, by everybody, including all the permanent members of the Security Council, opening up the process of the selection of secretary, next Secretary General and opening it up really a tiny little bit was seen as a very minor concession to a number of countries, politicians, NGOs in particular, British NGOs actually in particular, who were very instrumental in pushing for opening up the process of uh, the selection of Secretary General and formed and helped form this and run this uh, big NGO sort of umbrella organization called One for Seven Billion. And one thing they pushed for was opening the process of the Secretary General. There were other things for selection. There were other things such as, uh, for instance, changing from a two-term possibilities for the same person to run for the Secretary General for two terms, five-year terms, to change that into a one seven-year term. Uh, there were also ideas about suspending the veto uh, rights of the permanent members of the Security Council. Um, a number of other things that were uh, discussed. For now, none of these things passed. One thing that did pass, I suspect because everybody thought it was so benign that it wouldn't change anything, was to have the... Um, as they call the informal dialogues, meaning the presentation of all the candidates for the Secretary General in front of all the 193 member states of uh, the United Nations, um, and open that to the general public and to the world media. In the end, they will still, sometime in the second half of July, they will still close the doors of the Security Council and discuss among themselves, do this straw polling, as they call it, evaluating candidates on different criteria. Security Council will uh, decide on the name of the candidate for the Secretary General. They will probably announce it in October. It will go, one name will go to the uh, General Assembly and it will almost certainly be uh, elected. Uh, everybody's mentioning permanent members of the Security Council because, as you know, they're the ones who have the veto. 
There are 15 members of the Security Council, five permanent, 10 elected and rotating. In order to be appointed Secretary General, you need, 50, you need nine out of 15 votes. But in that nine, you have to have all the five votes of the permanent members, meaning each permanent member has a veto, uh, veto power. The idea was that this time around, since, since the uh, uh, foundation of the United Nations, there has never been a woman uh, in the position of Secretary General, that this time around women will have a certain advantage. As all these things in the United Nations, nothing is written in stone, meaning it doesn't mean that it can be only a woman. But if a woman meets the criteria, i.e. also is acceptable to all the uh, Security Council members or the permanent members, uh, that woman might get a certain advantage if it's in every other way uh, equal with a male candidate. And in the famous geopolitical rotation that Eastern Europe, the only region, the regions in the UN, of course, were established after the Second World War. So this is why they have some, in some cases, strange names, such as Eastern Europe, which, is, uh, which was a very distinct region in 45, 46, et cetera, et cetera, but is a more diffuse region uh, at the moment. But in any event, this is a UN-defined region. Eastern Europe never had a candidate. And so Eastern Europe uh, would was named as the region from which the next secretary general should come. Uh, this has created a lot of um, debate or politicking among especially the permanent members. And at the moment, we have 10 candidates, seven of them from Eastern Europe, one from New Zealand, one from uh, Portugal, which is, would be considered the group Western Europe and others, but one from Argentina that came uh, in only about two weeks ago or, or so, former, uh, former uh, chef de cabinet of Ban Ki-moon and now for the last five months uh, foreign minister of, of Argentina. We all had a chance to present ourselves, and the last two candidates, the Czech foreign minister and the Argentinian foreign minister, are doing this today or yesterday uh, in front of the General Assembly. Um, it's very difficult, even if you want it to say, you know, I will say all the things that they want to hear in order to increase my chances. It's very difficult to uh, guess what are all the things that you want to hear, and especially uh, those things might not be the same for all the uh, permanent members of the Security Council. So um, the easiest and probably the only way you can take is be yourself and, and try to present uh, yourself the way you are through your experience and through your... Um, I would say fights and battles and objectives in your political and civil life. And I've had a lot of those um, since I worked as an academic. I also worked as a uh, civil society activist, NGO activist, running a political journal and a political NGO in the 90s in Croatia. And as a politician in the narrower sense, because I consider people working in the civil society as politicians in the broader sense, and the politician in the narrower sense, meaning uh, running for office and being in parliament or being in, in government. I spent obviously more time in, in opposition than in government, but was also uh, foreign minister and deputy prime minister in the last, last government. However, the three or four, depending on how you look at it, topics that are the key topics of the UN, and this is peace and security, 
uh, human rights development, humanitarian assistance, but this can be combined with the, with the first three, have stayed and been with me all my life uh, as part of my sort of growing up, uh, evaluating my own society, um, trying to understand how you can be active in a one-party state, how you can sort of try to introduce pluralism in a one-party state, going through an East European transition in the country that was least dictatorial, let's say, but went through one of the worst transitions through the war that we uh, had gone through. Having seen this United Nations in action in uh, the country, in the neighborhood, with all the pluses and, and minuses. So the topics, the objectives of the UN are not new to me, on the contrary. They are something that I've worked on and with my entire life. The organization is because I'm not part of the organization, and haven't been part of the organization. And actually you have two types of candidates, two groups of candidates in this 10 candidates so far. Uh, one group, people who are from the system, from within, and one group, people who are from outside, who are outsiders, who weren't part of the organization. The advantage of the people who are coming from the organization is that they're predictable. Everybody knows who they are and what they're going to do. The disadvantage is that it's not likely that they will change much. The advantage of people who are coming from outside is that it's quite likely that they will bring in new energy, new ideas, do things differently. The disadvantage is that you don't know who's crazy. In other words, they're unpredictable and some of us might be really too unpredictable or, or uh, too sort of, um, let's say, entrepreneurial and uh, either endanger the organization or create conflict that uh, blocks uh, the possibility to do anything in an organization that is very complicated. A number of people told me, and also in, the, in, the, in my sort of discussions, many talks that I had with the people at the UN and around the UN and who have experience with the UN, was um, management. Management is the key thing. Everybody will want you to say, I will manage the organization more efficiently, differently. This is what I will focus on. And indeed, this is a very important issue. Uh, the UN needs different management, but at the same time, nobody runs for the Secretary General because she or he is excited about managing the organization. People go for that type of job because they're excited about human rights, peace, different approach to peace, uh, development, combining these things. Management of the organization is something that's necessary in order to be able to do something in these other, other areas. And I'm certainly uh, somebody who is more excited with the uh, topics of the UN than with the bureaucratic aspect. Although I've ran different institutions and organizations in my life, and everybody who's done that knows that without having a more or less efficient or, or acceptably efficient uh, organization, uh, you are not likely to achieve the obje objectives of that organization and goals. So, And I will end with not telling you what... Uh, in detail, I think, needs to be done in all the areas, just with one or two sentences in each of the three areas, plus management, what I think should be and would be the emphasis if I got the job. In peace and security, there were a lot of different debates on the problems with the peacekeepers, and we can discuss that in our questions and answers. <laughs> One thing that the UN has, has actually done right and has been um, 
exceptionally or, or above average successful in were negotiators. Negotiators who worked for the UN that were very often more efficient and definitely cheaper, but also more efficient, which is more important, than soldiers on the ground. And if you look at conflict prevention through conflict and then post-conflict reconstruction as four or five phases, maybe only in one, and this is keeping the warring parties, warring parties apart, you actually need soldiers on the ground. All the other things, a skillful, reliable, experienced negotiator is better. And I would argue that uh, with some examples from uh, the UN and with the argument that UN hasn't really developed an intellectual capital based on people who worked as negotiators in different war, war conflict situations and that this is the direction in which it should go and, and the, where the emphasis should be. Development. First of all, one thing that I was really surprised by was that development within the UN speak and organization is not necessarily seen as one of the key instruments for peacemaking, peace building, and creating sustainable peace. It's seen as a separate thing. There is peace and security, and there is development. Coming from the Croatian and Balkan experience, I would say that there is no way you can build sustainable peace without using development as direct instrument of building sustainable peace. In order to do this, you need to broaden the base of countries that participate as providers in development cooperation. And I would call this initi initiative in defense of small donors and can come back to that in, in our questions and answers. And finally, human rights. The current Secretary General has taken different and very important uh, initiatives in relation to human rights, including Human Rights First, as uh, uh, where he put the uh, respect for human rights as part of any UN mission and a sort of requirement of, of any uh, UN mission. I would argue that in any country, and particularly in countries that are emerging from war or going through war conflict, uh, poor countries, uh, countries devastated by different forms of conflict, human rights are not only the canary in the mine, it is actually the rights of women and girls that are the best indicators and at the same time the best starting point to start evaluating a country and rebuilding its human rights standards and human rights uh, record. And I can come back in the questions and answers to all of these issues. Thank you. Thank you so much.